Hey guys, Mamat Wanka here. Uh, I'm way excited about this project. So before we get started, I have a couple of really quick legal type things that I should set up before we get started. Um, this is the book that I'm reading from today. Stephen Bruce Zarig. Uh, it's by Ace Books. Um, this is like the super fancy three books in one of, a, of his first three books. Um, yeah, I did not write any of these words. I just read them aloud. Uh, I don't have any rights other than, you know, the hopeful free use is covered under this. Uh, this is one of my favorite books ever, and you should totally go and buy yourself a copy if you find this interesting. So, here we go. Zarek. Prologue. There is a similarity, if I may be permitted an excursion into tenuous metaphor, between the feel of a chilly breeze and the feel of a knife's blade as either is laid across the back of the neck. I can call up memories of both if I work at it. The chilly breeze is invariably going to be the more pleasant memory. For instance, I was eleven years old and clearing tables in my father's restaurant. It was a quiet evening with only a couple of tables occupied. A group had just left and I was walking over to the table they had used. The table in the corner was a deuce. One male, one female. Both Dragarian, of course. For some reason, humans rarely came into our place. Perhaps because we were human too and they didn't want the stigma or something. My father himself always avoided doing business with other Easterners. There were three at the table along the far wall. All of them were male and Dragarian. I noted that there was no tip at the table I was clearing, and heard a gasp from behind me. I turned as one member of the threesome let his head fall into his plate of lion leg with red peppers. My father had let me make the sauce for it that time, and, crazily, my first thought was to wonder if I'd built it wrong. The other two stood up smoothly, seeming not the least bit worried about their friend. They began moving toward the door, and I realized that they were planning to leave without paying. I looked for my father, but he was in the back. I glanced once more at the table, wondering whether I should try to help the fellow who was choking or intercept the two who were trying to walk out on their bill. Then I saw the blood. The hilt of a dagger was protruding from the throat of the fellow whose face was lying in his plate, and it slowly dawned on me what had happened, and I decided that no, I wasn't going to ask the two gentlemen who were leaving for money. They didn't run or even hurry. They walked quickly and quietly past me toward the door. I didn't move. I don't think I was even breathing. I remember suddenly becoming very much aware of my own heartbeat. One set of footsteps stopped directly behind me. I remained frozen while in my mind I cried out to Vera, the demon goddess. At that moment, something cold and hard touched the back of my neck. I was too frozen to flinch. I would have closed my eyes if I could have. Instead, I stared straight ahead. I wasn't consciously aware of it at the time, but the Dragarian girl was looking at me and she started to rise then. I noticed her when her companion reached out a hand to stop her, which she brushed off. Then I heard a soft, almost silky voice in my ear. You didn't see a thing, it said. Got that? If I had had as much experience then as I do now, I would have known that I was in no real danger. If he had any intention of killing me, he would have done so already. But I didn't, and so I shook. I felt I should nod, but I couldn't manage. The Dragarian girl was almost up to us now, and I imagined the guy behind me noticed her, because the blade was gone suddenly, and I heard retreating footsteps. I was shaking, uncontrollably. The tall Dragarian girl gently placed her hand on my shoulder. I saw sympathy on her face. It was a look I had never before been given from a Dragarian, and it was, in its own way, as frightening as the experience I had just been through. I had an urge to fall forward into her arms, but I didn't let myself. I became aware that she was speaking, softly, gently. It's all right, they've left. Nothing is going to happen. Just take it easy, you'll be fine. My father came storming in from the other room. Vlad, he called. What's going on here? Why? He stopped. He saw the body. I heard him getting sick, and I felt ashamed for him. The hand on my shoulder tightened then. I felt myself stop trembling, and I looked at the girl in front of me. Girl? I really couldn't judge her age at all, but being Dragarian, she could be anywhere from a hundred to a thousand years old. Her clothing was black and gray, which I knew meant she was of the house of Zareg. Her companion, who was now approaching us, was also a Zareg. The three who had been at the other table were of the same house. Nothing of any significance there. It was mostly Zareg, or an occasional Tekla, who came into our restaurant. 
Her companion stood behind her. Your name is Vlad, she asked me. I nodded. I'm Kira, she said. I only nodded again. She smiled once more and turned to her companion. They paid their bill and left. I went back to help clean up after the murdered man and my father. Kiera, I thought to myself, I won't forget you. When the Phoenix guards arrived some time later, I was in the back, and I heard my father telling them that no, no one had seen what had happened and we'd all been in the back. But I never forgot the feel of a knife blade as it is laid across the back of the neck. And, for another instance, I was sixteen and walking alone through the jungles west of Adrilanka. The city was somewhat more than a hundred miles away, and it was night. I was enjoying the feeling of solitude, and even the slight fear within my middle, as I considered the possibility that I might run into a wild zur, or a lion, or even, Vera preserve me, a dragon. The ground under my boots alternated between crunch and squish. I didn't make any effort to move quietly. I hoped that the noise I made would frighten off any beast which would otherwise frighten me off. The logic of that escapes me now. I looked up, but there was no break in the overcast that blankets the Dragarian Empire. My grandfather had told me that there was no such orange-red sky above his eastern homeland. He said that one could see stars at night, and I had often seen them through his eyes. He could open his mind to me, and did, often. It was part of his method for teaching witchcraft, a method that brought me, at age sixteen, to the jungles. The sky lit the jungle enough for me to pick my way. I ignored the scratches on my face and arms from the foliage. Slowly my stomach settled down from the nausea that had hit when I had done the teleport that brought me here. There was a good touch of irony there too, I realized, using a Dragarian sorcery to bring me to where I could take the next step in learning witchcraft. I hitched the pack on my back and stepped into the clearing. This one looked like it might do, I decided. There were heavy grasses for perhaps forty feet in what was, very roughly, a circle. I walked around it, slowly and carefully, my eyes straining to pick out details. All I needed now was to stumble into Chiothra's net. But it was empty, my clearing. I went to the middle of it and set my pack down. I dug out a small black brazier, a bag of coals, a single black candle, a stick of incense, a dead tecla, and a few dried leaves the leaves from the Gorianth plant, which is sacred to certain religions back east. I carefully crumbled the leaves into a coarse powder. Then I walked the perimeter of the clearing and sprinkled it before me as I went. I returned to the middle. I sat there for a time and went through the ritual of relaxing each muscle of my body until I was almost in a trance. With my body relaxed, my mind had no choice but to follow. When I was ready, I placed the coals in the brazier slowly, one at a time. I held each one for a moment, feeling its shape and texture, letting the suit rub off on my palms. With witchcraft, everything can be a ritual. Even before the actual enchantment begins, the preparation should be made properly. Of course, one can always just cast one's mind out, concentrating on the desired result, and hope. The odds of success that way aren't very good. Somehow, when done the right way, witchcraft is so much more satisfying than sorcery. When the coals were in the brazier and placed just so, I put the incense among them. Taking the candle, I stared long and hard at the wick, willing it to burn. I could, certainly, have used a flint or even sorcery to start it, but doing it this way helped put me into the proper frame of mind. I guess the mood of the jungle night was conductive to witchcraft. It was only a few minutes before I saw smoke rising from the candle, followed quickly by a small flame. I was also pleased that I felt no trace of the mental exhaustion that accompanies the completion of a major spell. There had been a time, not so long before, when the lighting of a candle would have left me too weak even for psionic communication. I'm learning, Grandfather. I used the candle then to start the coals burning and laid my will upon it to get a good fire going. When it was burning well, I planted the candle in the ground. The scent of the incense, pleasantly sweet, reached my nostrils. I closed my eyes. The circle of crushed Gorinth leaves would prevent any stray animals from wandering by me and disturbing me. I waited. After a time, I don't know how long, I opened my eyes again. The coals were glowing softly. The scent of the incense filled the air. The sounds of the jungle did not penetrate past the boundaries of the clearing. I was ready. I stared deep into the coals, and, timing my breathing, I spoke the chant very slowly as I had been taught. As I said each word, I cast it, sending it out into the jungle as far and as clearly as I could. It was an old spell, my grandfather had said, and had been used in the east for thousands of years, unchanged. 
I agonized over each word, each syllable, exploring it, letting my tongue and mouth linger over and taste each of the sounds, and willing my brain to full understanding of each of the thoughts I was sending. As each word left me, it was imprinted on my consciousness, and seemed to be a living thing itself. The last sounds died out very slowly in the jungle night, taking a piece of me with them. Now, indeed, I felt exhausted. As always when doing a spell of this power, I had to guard myself against falling into a deep trance. I breathed evenly and deeply. As of sleepwalking, I picked up the dead Tekla and moved it to the edge of the clearing where I could see it when I was sitting. Then I waited. I believe it was only a few minutes later that I heard the flapping of wings near me. I opened my eyes and saw Azarag at the edge of the clearing, near the dead Tekla, looking at me. We watched each other for a while, and then it tentatively moved up and took a small bite from my offering. It was of average size, if female, a bit large if male. If my spell had worked, it would be female. Its wingspan was about the distance from my shoulder to my wrist, and it was a bit less than that from its snake-like head to the tip of its tail. The forked's tongue flicked out over the rodent, tasting each piece before ripping off a small chunk, chewing and swallowing. It ate very slowly, watching me, watching it. When I saw that it was nearly done, I began to compose my mind for psionic contact, and to hope. Soon, it came. I felt a small, questing thought within me. I allowed it to grow. It became distinct. What is it you want? I heard, with surprising clarity. Now came the real test. If this Zerag had come as a result of my spell, it would be female, with a nest of eggs, and what I was about to suggest wouldn't send it into an attack of rage. If it was just a Zerag who was passing by and saw some carrion lying free for the taking, I could be in trouble. I had with me a few herbs which might prevent me from dying of the Zerag's poison, but then again, they might not. Mother, I thought back to it as clearly as I could, I would like one of your eggs. It didn't attack me, and I picked up no feeling of puzzlement or outrage at the suggestion. Good. My spell had brought her, and she would be at least receptive to bargaining. I felt excitement growing in me and forced it down. I concentrated on the Zerg before me. This part was almost a ritual in itself, but not quite. It all depended on what the Zerg thought of me. What? she asked. Do you offer it? I offer it long life, I answered, and fresh red meat without struggle, and I offer it my friendship. The animal considered this for a while, and then said, And what will you ask of it? I will ask it for aid in my endeavors, such are in its power. I will ask for its wisdom, and I will ask for its friendship. For a time, then, nothing happened. She stood there above the skeletal remains of the Tekla, and watched me. Then she said, I approach you. The Zerg walked up to me. Its claws were long and sharp, but more useful for running than for fighting. After a full meal, a Zerg will often find that it weighs too much to become airborne, and so must run to escape its enemies. She stood before me and looked closely into my eyes. It was odd to see intelligence in small, beady snake eyes, and to have nearly human-level communication with an animal whose brain was no larger than the first joint of my finger. It seemed, somehow, unnatural, which it was, but I didn't find that out for quite some time. After a while, the Zerg spoke again. "'Wait here.' she said, and she turned and spread her bat-like wings. She had to run a step or two before taking off, and then I was alone again. Alone. I wondered what my father would say if he were alive to say anything. He wouldn't approve, of course. Witchcraft was too eastern for him, and he was too involved, trying to be Dragarian. My father died when I was fourteen. I never knew my mother, but my father would occasionally mutter something about the witch he had married. Shortly before his death, he squandered everything he had earned in forty years of running a restaurant in an effort to become even more Dragarian. He bought a title. Thus we became citizens and found ourselves linked to the Imperial Orb. This link allowed us to use sorcery, a practice which my father encouraged. He found a sorceress from the left hand of the Zerg, who was willing to teach me, and he forbade me to practice witchcraft. Then he found a swordmaster who agreed to teach me Dragarian-style swordsmanship. My father forbade me to study eastern fencing, but my grandfather was still around. One day I explained to him that, even when I was full grown, I would still be too short and too weak to be effective as a swordsman the way I was being taught, and that sorcery didn't interest me. He never offered a word of criticism about my father, but he began teaching me fencing and witchcraft. When my father died, he was pleased that I was a skilled enough sorcerer to teleport myself. He didn't know that teleports made me physically ill. He didn't know how often I would use witchcraft to cover up the bruises left by Dragarian punks, who would catch me alone and let me know what they thought of Easterners with pretensions. 
and he most certainly never knew that Kira had been teaching me how to move quietly, how to walk through a crowd as if I weren't there. I would use these skills, too. I would go out at night with a large stick, and I'd find one of my tormentors alone, and I'd leave him with a few broken bones. I don't know. Perhaps if I'd worked a little harder at sorcery, I'd have been good enough to save my father. I just don't know. After his death, it was easier to find time to study witchcraft and fencing, despite the added work of running a restaurant. I started to get quite good as a witch, good enough, in fact, that my grandfather finally said he couldn't teach me any more, and gave me instructions on how to take the next step on my own. The next step, of course, was... She returned to the clearing with a flapping of wings. This time she flew right up to me, landing in front of my cross legs. In her left claw, a small egg was clutched. She extended it. I forced down my excitement. It had worked! I held out my right hand, after making sure it was steady. The egg dropped into it. I was somewhat startled by its warmth. It was of a size that fit well into my palm. I carefully placed it inside my jerkin next to my chest. Thank you, mother, I thought to her. May your life be long, your food be plentiful, and your children many. And you, she said, long life and good hunting. I'm not a hunter, I told her. You will be, she said. And then she turned from me, spread her wings, and flew out from the clearing. Twice in the following week, I almost crushed the egg that I carried around next to my chest. The first time I got into a fight with a couple of jerks from the house of the orca, and the second I started to carry a box of spices against my chest while working in the restaurant. The incident shook me up, so I decided to make sure that nothing happened again that would put the egg in danger. To protect myself against the former, I learned diplomacy, and to take care of the latter, I sold the restaurant. Learning diplomacy was the more difficult task. My natural inclinations didn't run that way at all, and I had to be on my guard all the time. But eventually, I found that I could be very polite to a Jugarian who was insulting me. Sometimes I think it was that, more than anything else, which trained me to be successful later on. Selling the restaurant was more of a relief than anything else. I had been running it on my own since my father died, and doing well enough to make a living, but somehow I never thought of myself as a restauranter. However, it did bring me up rather sharply against the problem of what I was going to do for a living, both immediately and for the rest of my life. My grandfather offered me a half-interest in his witchcraft business, but I was well aware that there was hardly enough activity to keep him going alone. I also had an offer from Kira, who was willing to teach me her profession, but Easterner thieves don't get good prices from Jagarian fences. Besides, my grandfather didn't approve of stealing. I sold the place with the problem still unresolved and live off the proceeds for a while. I won't tell you what I got for it. I was still young. I moved into the new quarters then, too, since the place above the restaurant was going to be taken by the new owner. Also, I bought a blade. It was a rather light rapier made to my measurements by a swordsmith of House Jerig, who overcharged me shamefully. It was just strong enough to be able to counter the attacks of the heavier Dragarian sword, but light enough to be useful for the reposts by which an eastern fencer can surprise a Dragarian swordsman, who probably doesn't know anything beyond attack-defend-attack. Future unresolved, I sat back and tended my egg. About two months after I had sold the restaurant, I was sitting at a card table doing a little low-stakes gambling at a place that allowed Easterners in. That night I was the only human there, and there were about four tables in action. I heard raised voices from the table next to me and was about to turn around when something crashed into my chair. I felt a momentary surge of panic as I almost crushed the egg against the edge of the table, and I stood up. The panic transformed itself into anger, and without thinking, I picked up my chair and broke it over the head of the guy who had fallen into me. He dropped like a hawk and lay still. The guy who pushed him looked at me as if deciding whether to thank me or attack me. I still had the chair leg in my hand. I raised it and waited for him to do something. Then a hand gripped my shoulder, and I felt a familiar coldness along the back of my neck. "'We don't need fighting in here, punk,' said a voice behind my right ear. My adrenaline was up, and I almost turned around to smash the bastard across the face, despite the knife he held against me. But the training I'd been giving myself came to the fore, and I heard myself saying, My apologies, good sir. I assure you it won't happen again. I lowered my right arm and dropped the chair leg. There was no point in trying to explain to him what had happened, if he hadn't seen it, and even less if he had. When there's a problem and an Easterner is involved, there is no question about who is at fault. I didn't move. Presently, I felt the knife being taken off my neck. You're right, said the voice. It won't happen again. Get out of here and don't come back. I nodded once. I left my money on the table where it was and walked out without looking back. I settled down somewhat on my way home. The incident bothered me. I shouldn't have hit the guy at all, I decided. I had to let my fear take over and I had reacted without thinking. This would never do. 
As I climbed up the stairs to my apartment, my mind returned to the old problem of what I was going to do. I'd left almost a gold imperial's worth of coins lying on the table, and that was half a week's rent. It seemed that my only talents were witchcraft and beating up dragarians. I didn't think that there was much of a market for either. I opened the door and relaxed on the couch. I took out the egg to hold it for a while as a means of soothing my nerves, and stopped. There was a small crack in it. It must have happened when I banged against the table, although I'd thought it had escaped harm. It was then and there, at the age of sixteen, that I learned the meaning of anger. A sheet of white fire flashed through me as I remembered the face of the Dragarian who had pushed the other into me, killing my egg. I learned that I was capable of murder. I intended to seek out that bastard, and I was going to kill him. There was no question in my mind that he was a dead man. I stood up and headed for the door, still holding the egg, and st stopped again. Something was wrong. I had a feeling which I couldn't pin down that was getting through the barrier of my anger. What was it? I looked down at the egg and, s and suddenly understood in a burst of relief. Although not consciously aware of it, I had somehow gotten a psionic link to the being inside the egg. I was feeling something through it, on some level, and that meant my Zerg was alive. Anger drained from me as quickly as it had come, leaving me trembling. I went back into the middle of the room and set the egg down on the floor as softly as I could. I felt along the link and identified the emotion I was getting from it. Determination. Just raw, blind purpose. I'd never been in contact with such a singleness of aim. It was startling that a thing could, that small could produce such high-powered emotion. I stepped away from it, I suppose, from some unreasoning desire to give it air, and watched. There was an almost inaudible tap-tap, and the crack widened. Then suddenly the egg split apart, and this ugly little reptile was lying amid broken shell fragments. Its wings were tightly drawn up against it, and its eyes were closed. The wings were no larger than my thumb. It... it... he, I suddenly knew. He tried to move, failed, tried to move again and got nowhere. I felt that I should be doing something, although I had no idea what. His eyes opened, but didn't seem to focus on anything. His head lay on the floor, then moved, pitifully. I felt along my link to him, and now felt confusion and a little fear. I tried to send back feelings of warmth, protection, and all that good stuff. Slowly I walked up and reached for him. Surprisingly, he must have seen my motion. He obviously didn't connect the movement with the thoughts he was getting from me, however, for I felt a quick burst of fear and he tried to move away. He failed and I picked him up, gingerly. I got two things for this. My first clear message from him and my first Zareg bite. The bite was too small and the poison still too weak for it to affect me, but he was certainly in possession of his fangs. The message was amazingly distinct. Mama, he said. Right, Mama. I thought over that for a while, then tried to send a message back. No, Daddy, I told him. Mama, he agreed. He stopped struggling and seemed to settle down in my hand. I realized that he was exhausted, and then realized that I was too. Also, we were both hungry. At that point it hit me. What the hell was I going to feed him? All the time I had been carrying him, I had known that he was going to hatch some day, but it never really sunk in that there was actually going to be a real live Zerig there. I carried him into the kitchen and started hunting around. Let's see. Milk. We'll start with that. I managed to get out a saucer and pour a little milk into it. I set it down on the counter and set the Zerg next to it, his head actually in the saucer. He lapped up a little and didn't seem to be having any trouble, so I scouted around a little more and finally came up with a small piece of hawk wing. I placed it in the saucer. He found it almost at once. He tore a piece off. He had teeth already. Good. And began chewing. He chewed it for close to three minutes before swallowing, but when he did, it went down with no trouble. I relaxed. After that, he seemed more tired than hungry, so I picked him up and carried him over to the couch. I lay down and placed him on my stomach. I dozed off shortly thereafter. We shared pleasant dreams. The next day, someone came to my door and clapped, around mid-afternoon. When I opened the door, I recognized the fellow immediately. He was the one who had been running the game the day before, and he had told me not to come back, with a knife held against the back of my neck for added emphasis. I invited him in, being the curious type. Thank you, he said. I'm called Nylar. Please sit down, my lord. I'm Vlad Taltos. Wine? Thank you, but no, I don't expect to be staying very long. As you wish. I showed him to a seat and sat down on the couch. I picked up my Zerig and held him. Nylar arched his eyebrows, but didn't say anything. What can I do for you, then? I asked. It has come to my attention, he said, that I was, perhaps, in the wrong when I faulted you for the events of yesterday. What? A Dragarian apologizing to an Easterner? I wondered if the world was coming to an end. This was, to say the least, unprecedented in my experience. 
I mean, I was a sixteen-year-old human, and he was a Jagarian who was probably close to a thousand. That's very kind for you to say, my lord, I managed. He brushed it off. I will also add that I liked the way you handled yourself. He did? I didn't. What was going on here? What I'm getting at, he continued, is that I could use someone like you, if you have a mind to work for me. I understand you don't have a job at the moment, and... He finished with a shrug. There were several thousand questions I wanted to ask him, starting with, How did you find out so much about me, and why do you care? But I didn't know how to go about asking them, so I said, With all respect, my lord, I can't see what kind of things I can do for you. He shrugged again. For one thing, preventing the kind of problems we had last night. Also, I need help from time to time collecting debts, that sort of thing. I normally have two people who assist me in running the place, but one of them had an accident last week, so I'm short-handed just at the moment. Something about the way he said accident struck me as strange, but I didn't take any time out to guess what he meant. Again, with all respect, my lord, it doesn't seem to me that an Easterner is going to look very imposing when standing up to a Jagarian. I don't know that I... I'm convinced it won't be any problem, he said. We have a friend in common, and she assured me that you'd be able to handle this kind of thing. As it happens, I owe her a favor or two, and she asked me to consider taking you on. She? There wasn't any doubt, of course. Kira was looking out for me again, bless her heart. Suddenly things were a lot clearer. Your pay, he continued, would be four Imperials a week, plus ten percent of any outstanding debts you are sent to collect. Or actually half of that, since you'll be working with my other assistant. Sheesh! Four gold a week? That was already more than I usually made when I was running the restaurant. And the commission, even if it were split with... Are you sure this assistant of yours isn't going to object with working with a hu... an Easterner? His eyes narrowed. That's my problem, he said, and as a matter of fact, I've already discussed it with Kragar, and he doesn't mind at all. I nodded. I'll have to think it over, I said. That's fine. You know where to reach me. I nodded and showed him to the door with pleasant words on all sides. I looked down at my Zerig at as the door snicked shut. Well, I asked him, what do you think? The Zerig didn't answer, but then I had unexpected him, too. I sat down to think and to wonder if the question of my future were being settled or just put off. Then I put it aside. I had more important questions to settle. What was I going to name my Zerig? I called him Loyosh. He called me Mama. I trained him. He bit me. Slowly, over the course of the next few months, I developed an immunity to his poison. Even more slowly, over the course of years, I developed a partial immunity to his sense of humor. As I stumbled into my line of work, Loyosh was able to help me, first a little, then a great deal. After all, who notices another Zerig flying about the city? The Zerig, on the other hand, can notice a great deal. Slowly, as time went on, I grew in skill, status, friends, and experience. And, just as his mother had predicted, I became a hunter. Hey guys, I hope you really, really enjoyed that. I know I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot while reading it out loud. Uh, I plan to do a video like this every week through the year 2014, maybe even more going in the future. Um, if you like this book, please let me know down below, uh, or if you've read it before, that's good. If you know anybody who loves reading and you think would love this book, please share this video with them. Uh, and if you want to know more about my thoughts on the book, and on Stephen Bruce and on the world, click here somewhere, and you'll go to the other video uh, that I'll be putting out at the same time um, to be able to talk about it. So thank you guys for watching very much. Stay online. I'll see you next time. Peace out.